Dr Hewitt, having established before lunch the importance that have been attached within the blood transfusion service for decades to both reporting of cases and adequate record keeping and follow up. What I want um, to do now is ask you about the systems in place at the North London Regional Transfusion Centre for the reporting of investigation of cases of post-transfusion hepatitis from when you were there in 1984. What, what can you recall the process being? Um, I recall the process being um, that when a report was received, it was logged and I think generally at that time it would be assigned a case number. Um, and then reports were often initially received over the telephone. Uh, and I think even at that time we had a form that we then sent to the reporter uh, to collect the information we required in order to assess and, and then investigate. So obviously one of the very important things was a, a record of all the blood components which had been transfused to the individual who was the subject of the report. Um, and it was often very difficult because sometimes the report would be received by somebody who didn't have that information uh, and then we would need that information from the hospital blood transfusion laboratory which wasn't necessarily where the report had come from and then we would receive the report back and we would transfer the information into the file and assess what information we had what information was missing um, and then in general, investigate the case. But I say in general because sometimes we would receive an initial report and then by the time we received the information, it was quite clearly not a case that, that was associated with transfusion for a variety of reasons. Uh, but if there was any doubt, then it would be considered a case that we should be investigating. And from that stage, for, from investigation, the first thing that would be done would be to... Uh, identify from the donation numbers which had been provided uh, the identity of the donors to whom those donations related, uh, establish whether there were any other blood components from the same blood donation which remained in date, so could in theory still be in stock either at the transfusion centre or in a hospital. Uh, now, generally, uh, because of the nature of these things, these reports will be received weeks or months after a trans or even years after a transfusion. So that generally only related to if there were frozen components, uh, which have a short, long shelf life, uh, in which case those would be removed from stock. And then we would investigate the case, um, and that would generally involve and I'm having difficulty remembering now what was, st what was in place early and what it was in place later, but we would generally write to the donors and request a further blood sample for investigation. Um, and we sent them a letter um, recognising that that can be quite an alarming thing for a blood donor to be asked for another blood sample because their blood had been uh, involved in a possible case of transmission of infection. Uh, so we always said you are one of many donors um, and asking them to provide us another blood sample. And then depending, if it was a case of hepatitis B, we clearly would then test it again for markers of hepatitis B, both surface antigen and additional markers for hepatitis B. If it was non-A, non-B hepatitis, then the only testing we had available to us was to do an ALT test, a test of the liver function, and to do the additional test for hepatitis B, the anti-hepatitis B core test. And then we would review the results um, and make an appropriate conclusion, which I'm afraid in the early days, in particular with non-A, non-B hepatitis, was often, we just can't say. Sometimes we could, sometimes we, we, we would get a sample from a donor 
uh, and there were markers of ALT or anti-core which strongly suggested that this donor could be a carrier for non-A, non-B hepatitis. And in that case, we would inform the donor that uh, unfortunately they would no longer be able to donate uh, and remove them from the donor panel. And then if I can just ask you to a handful of questions about that process in a little more detail. In terms of the reports that you received at the centre, that would typically be from a clinician or possibly the hospital blood bank at a hospital where the blood or blood component had been used. Would it, or would it be by a clinician under whose care subsequently a, a recipient had, had um, come and, and who had identified perhaps hepatitis? It's very much varied. Uh, I mean, sometimes it could be uh, the patient was now under the care of a different hospital. Um, many of the cases did come through the hospital blood transfusion laboratory, but not always. And, and, and definitely in more recent years, um, reports have come from local public health teams who've been investigating a case of hepatitis in the community. But I, I think in the early days that was much less likely. Um, um, was there, as far as you can recall, any reporting obligation on the centre? In other words, it, it, having received a report, having investigated, if you concluded that this was a case of post-transfusion hepatitis, did you then report that to the Department of Health? Or I, I, th I think that was done. I didn't personally do it, um, but I think it was done. And I'm, I'm, I'm fairly sure Dr. Barbara might be able to help you on that. Um, and then... Um, if, if one follows through the process of investigation, if we assume that it's a case where um, um, you are satisfied at the conclusion of the investigation that this is a case of post-transfusion hepatitis, you've traced the donor, you've described to us the contact that would be made with the donor. Um, at, at this point in time, and I'm really talking here about the 80s, mm -hmm. prior to any formal look back uh, exercise in, in, in the 90s, would there be any attempt to follow up other recipients of um, blood or blood components from the donor? We definitely um, followed up other blood components of the same blood donation, definitely. And I, I have very re clear recollections of one particular case. And I think I've seen a letter in the, in the documents where I, we had investigated a case um, this is quite a long story. Um, it was non-A but non-B hepatitis. We did have a donor who we identified as likely to be the source of that infection. And I think in 1988, the sample from that donor was provided to the Chiron Corporation for testing in their early hepatitis C test and they reported to us that they had obtained a reaction in their test. And we then went ahead and traced the recipient of the, the other component from the blood donation. So I, I know we did it for that one, and I'm perfectly quite certain we would have done for others. But I can't guarantee that we would have looked at past donations. Well, that was going to be my next yeah. question. Uh, and then um, I just want to look uh, with you at three documents from 1990. Um, uh, on the issue of investigation of, of, of post-transfusion hepatitis. The first is NHBT 0003770. So this is a letter from you to Dr. Gunson, 7th of June, yes. 1990. Post-transfusion hepatitis B reports... Summary for North London Blood Transfusion Centre, 1986 to 1989. Uh, in view of our recent experience, Marcella asked me to review our PTH reports over the last four years, with particular emphasis on the serological characteristics of donors implicated or possibly implicated in cases of post-transfusion hepatitis B. And then you go on to describe the cases that have been investigated over that four-year period. Between 1986 and 1989, there were a total of 14 reports of hepatitis B to us, which we felt were likely to be associated with blood transfusion. As you will see, we investigate three to four cases of possible slash probable post-transfusion hepatitis B each year. Two of these were felt to be due to transfusion abroad and no recall of NLBTC donors followed. In a further two cases, there was no donor follow-up 
because the report involved an incidental finding of hepatitis B surface antigen positivity in a multi-transfused recipient without any indication of date of seroconversion or indeed proof of a previous hepatitis B surface antigen negative status. C can you just explain a little more what the reasoning was, not, not in the cases where it was thought to be due to transfusion abroad, but in those two cases? I don't remember the cases, um, but I imagine that these were, it says they were multi-transfused recipients, um, patients who'd been transfused over a significant length of time, uh, for which we had no indication when the infection might have been acquired and therefore potentially could have been investigated tens, hundreds of donors um, and felt that that was not an exercise that we could carry out. And then you continue, in eight of the remaining ten cases, an attempt was made to contact all involved donors. The response rate was high, although not complete. In three cases, all resample donors were negative for HBV markers, and in another three, one resample donor was anti-HBC positive and withdrawn as possibly implicated. One case, was predict one case was predicted by us when a donor was detected hepatitis B surface antigen positive at the next donation. The previous donation was subsequently confirmed HBSAG negative. This donor was obviously in the early infectious stages of hepatitis B infection, but below the level of detection in HBSAG screening tests at the time of the implicated donation. The final case has been fully documented. And then over the page. Um, this leaves two cases where the numbers of donors involved were huge and recall of all donors thought to be logistically impossible. Examination of records revealed a common donor found to be anti-HBC positive on recall. Thus, out of 14 documented cases in 1986 to 9, four not investigated for reasons given, five implicated donor anti-HBC positive HBSAG negative, three no HBV markers identified in resample donors and no donor implicated, one donor in an early stage of HBV infection but HBSAG negative, one donor had low level HBSAG. Um, this summary indicates that the checking of original hepatitis B surface antigen results on donors involved in post-transfusion hepatitis B inquiries is unlikely to be of help to BPL in deciding the fate of held products. Our latest report to BPL involving 183 donors and 120 plasma donations forwarded to BPL required 15 hours of senior scientific officer time to check original hepatitis B surface antigen results. If the checking of previous HBSAG test results is now to be part of BPL's requirements, we shall obviously require additional resources. Um, now, if we just leave aside the reference to BPL for a mm. moment, because I'll, I'll pick that up shortly. Yeah. Um, it, it is what we see described in this letter, effectively, the, the, the standard practice um, in relation to hepatitis B, uh, also reports of post-transfusion hepatitis, insofar as it's thought that hepatitis B might be involved. So they would all be considered, but some might not be further investigated for the reasons, for a range of reasons, some of which are illustrated by this letter. Some might be fully investigated, others it might be disproportionate or thought, was thought disproportionate to investigate. So a range of possible outcomes to an investigation process. That's correct, at North London. Do you know um, what the approach was at any other RTC? I don't. Um, and then we see there the reference to BPL. Yes. Um, and I just want to pick that up by reference to two other documents, and perhaps if you can then help us understand yes. what yes. the issue was there. Um, NHBT 30 underscore 002, please. Um, so this is a... Um, what's said to be a, an, an, a North London standard procedure, initiation and working of a report of hepatitis slash jaundice after transfusion. Um, and this appears to be a document prepared by a senior microbiologist approved by you, June 1990. Um, purpose to provide a detailed procedure for the initiation and running of an inquiry following a report of hepatitis or jaundice after issue of blood from NLBTC. And then if we go over the page, I'm not going to go through all of it, but um, if we can just touch on the headline points. So it's said to be initiation and working of a jaundice inquiry 
purpose to establish a detailed procedure for the initiation and running of a jaundice post-transfusion hepatitis inquiry following the issue of NLBTC blood and components. And so what we then see as the suggested process is um, any notification passed to uh, um, either a medical officer or it might be you or it might be Dr Barbara and so on. Um, and then the file is opened. Um, it, it appears from three and four, the case is passed to you. Yes. Um, and then if we go further down, um, paragraph five, w when details are returned, so you ask for further details from the hospital, presumably batch numbers or, or, or the like, would that be right? Yes, and for details of the hepatitis B testing in the recipient. Um, because without that, you can't... You can't properly assess really. a case. Uh, and then paragraph five tells us that you would then decide whether to instigate an inquiry in consultation with the head of microbiology. Would that have been Dr. Barbara? Yes. Um, and then um, there's paragraph six refers to donation numbers um, being forwarded for onward transmission to BPL. Yes. So presumably that's only if the donation's been used uh, or has been, well, the, the plasma has been sent to BPL. Or that be yes. So uh, after evidence. checking the computer records. So that there would be a check of the computer records to see which of the donations had been used to prepare plasma for BPL. And then the donation numbers of those donations were passed for notification of BPL. Uh, paragraph seven, donation numbers uh, must be traced back to the donors. And then if we go to the next page, um, 7.1 tells us that then the, the, the 101 cards will um, um, be traced. And that's said to be in relation to the static centres, I think, and then uh, and all donations prior to May 1990. Um, and then we see the reason for that in 7.2, which is at the mobile clinics after that date, there'll be no 101 card, presumably because it's been computerised by yes. then. Uh, and then paragraph 8 refers to the contacting of donors by letter where donor details are received. Um, at the bottom of the page... Um, provides for the 101 cards to be stamped during this inquiry. Is that so that if the donor comes back to donate whilst there's an ongoing during this inquiry, the uh, donor session clerk or medical officer or someone at the centre will be alerted yes. to that? And, and would that mean that they'd be deferred or that they would the donation would be held in quarantine pending the outcome of the inquiry? Um, the... 101 cards were stamped during this inquiry, and that would obviously stay on the 101 card. Um, at the completion of the inquiry, there would be an entry making clear whether that donor had been withdrawn or not. Uh, on the computer, it was much easier. Um, but in general, if, if a donor had misunderstood and come and attempted to donate while still under investigation, they a donation would not be taken. And then if we go over the page, um, there's then provision um, for uh, um, uh, further, further testing. Paragraph 12 deals with where results are negative and the 101s are returned to records. Um, paragraph 13, um, do I understand that to mean that, that again, where, where the outcome is, the, the donor is negative, they'll be told, and so they can come back and donate. And yeah, yeah, sent to the donors who are negative, yes. And then 14 talks about donors with a positive result, notified by a consultant or the hepatitis counsellor by letter, the 101 card taken off the panel and a master file card withdrawn, yellow file made up for donors implicated in hepatitis B transmission, and a repeat sample is requested from the donor every three, six or 12 months. Um, and the donor's name's put in the hepatitis B surface antigen positive book. So there was a separate file or book was there, record somehow maintained. Of yes, I suppose that, that was an early database, I suppose. I, I know that counsellor is spelt wrongly, and I, I'm not actually quite sure who the hepatitis counsellor was, but it was possibly Dr. Barbara. Um, and then we have reference to, if it's non-A, non-B transmission, um, it's a yellow file with green stripes to distinguish it from the hepatitis B. Mm and the 101 card put in the NANB panel. These donors are called in annually for samples. What, what, what was I that? I don't recall that at all. Um, and then I, think it must, I think it must have stopped fairly quickly. And then paragraph 16, if donors in a jaundice inquiry do not respond, there's a further letter. And then if there's no response, 
Um, it says, Dr. Hewitt will make a decision whether the 101 should be withdrawn from the panel. Um, was, was that a common occurrence, as far as you can recall? Um, it was not common, no, but it, it wasn't unusual to have a donor in an inquiry who didn't respond. So there was then a judgment that fell to you to be made as to whether um, steps would be taken to try and prevent that donor from, from donating again? Yes, and I have to say that if a donor had failed to respond twice to a letter, letter then the default position would be to withdraw the donor from the panel. Uh, and then paragraph 17, if a donor is implicated in post-transfusion hepatitis transmission, then the fate of any other components of the same or any subsequent donation must be traced and the relevant hospital informed by letter. So you didn't go back and trace earlier donations, but the implicated donation and any, late, and, and mm. any donations that post-dated that would be traced. Is that right? Yes, sorry. Um, and then... We go to the next page. I don't think we need to go through all the details of it. Paragraph 22 tells us all files must be reviewed by, by, the, doc, by the consultant, Dr. Hewitt, in the first week of each month. Uh, and then copies of the report sent. And then we can see, amongst others, it's to Dr. Barbara and Dr. Tedder. And this is dated 7th of June, 1990. Oh. Now, was this describing a, a new and more formal and structured process as at June 1990? Or was this an attempt to put into writing the process that was already in operation? I think it was the latter, but I think it was the opportunity to really review and, and, um, and to improve what we were doing. I, I, think it, it, I think it covered all the steps that were already being done, but I think it was making much more clear whose responsibility it was to do everything. And probably the timelines were new. It, it, was, it was very often the case that these investigations took some time to complete because we were always waiting for things to happen or people to respond. And there needed to be some review to make sure that things were not drifting and just being left. Um, so I think that maybe was, was new, but I, I think really this summarised what had already been done but was in our heads. And at the risk of stating the obvious, n n all of this depended upon two things, that the hospital or, or blood bank or clinician or someone reporting the post-transfusion hepatitis to the centre and there being sufficient records within the hospital blood bank um, or within the patient files to enable um, you to have the, the core information to be able to identify the donor. Yes, and, and also, uh, I think this was referred to yesterday, that somebody recognising that, that there was a case of hepatitis which was possibly related to a blood transfusion. So what, it may have been in a minority of cases or a small number of cases relative to the overall number that actually ever got to the transfusion centre for investigation? It would have been a minority because the majority of cases would have been subclinical. We only knew about the people who had become obviously ill. And, and then just to complete the picture, can we look at NHBT 0003772? Uh, this is a letter from you to Dr Moore, who was the Deputy National Director within the National Directorate at this time, so the Deputy to Dr Gunson. Um, 6th of June 1990, so it's the day before, I think, the document that we just looked at. There is some other correspondence from around this time uh, about issues relating to BPL and investigations of, of, of possible cases of post-transfusion hepatitis. I'm just hoping whether this would enable you to... Whether, whether you, sorry, whether you can assist us in understanding what the issue mm. was specifically in relation to BPL... Yeah. It refers to further details having been requested by BPL in two particular inquiries. Um, and then in the third paragraph, um, you say, um, uh, effectively, BPL still does not understand our procedure for jaundice inquiries. And then it continues, we only report cases to BPL when we've assured ourselves that a report from a hospital concerning hepatitis in a transfusion recipient is likely to be associated with the transfusion. Thus, if more than six months has elapsed after transfusion before the development of hepatitis B, 
then we, not the clinicians, decide that transfusion is not responsible for the infection. We do not start an inquiry and do not notify BPL. For example, yesterday I received notification of a case where 10 months had elapsed. I've asked the hospital to clarify the dates given, and if they confirm these as true, then there will be no inquiry and BPL will never know about it. And then the next paragraph. Secondly, we'd never start a hepatitis B inquiry without serological confirmation of acute hepatitis B infection in the recipient, preferably with evidence of seroconversion from a previous hepatitis B surface antigen negative status. If we reported to BPL every case provisionally labelled as post-transfusion hepatitis on an initial telephone report from a hospital, then there would certainly be no finished project for BPL to issue. We pride ourselves on establishing the full background to the case before starting an inquiry and notifying BPL of the possibly implicated plasma. Um, so, first of all, can you remember what the, the context was in terms of I, to and fro with BPL? Well, I believe that this was because BPL had now specified or made clear that they wanted us, transfusion centres, on the receipt of a report of possible post-transfusion hepatitis B to then report to BPL all the plasma donations which were involved in that in the donations involved in that inquiry before we had even started instituting or even decided whether there was a case to investigate and we felt that this would lead to a huge amount of work some of which would be completely unnecessary and would not be of assistance um, and we, we just felt that it, it was it was unworkable and if we just go back to the first page, the fourth paragraph, can you just explain for us what the thinking was in terms of this six-month cut-off? So the incubation period of hepatitis B infection is six weeks to six months. Uh, so that means that, I don't know what percent, but a very high percentage of cases uh, will have an incubation period. So from the time of exposure to hepatitis B to a diagnosis of acute hepatitis B would be six weeks to six months. And generally, most cases would fall at about three months. So if we received a case that this is a case of acute hepatitis B, and the investigations confirm it is acute hepatitis B, and it is 10 months since the date of the transfusion, then that would fall outside the incubation period for hepatitis B, and it was likely that there was another cause of the hepatitis B. Was that six month applicable only if what you was being reported to you was a possible case of acute hepatitis B? Yes. So if you had reported to you um, what was said possibly to be post-transfusion hepatitis where um, it, it may for example have been a report of possible non-A, non-B hepatitis where the transfusion was five years previously, would that be something that was investigated? I'm not sure that we ever had that situation because by its very nature, the majority, the majority of cases we received, uh, reports we received related to cases of acute hepatitis. Um, and why was that, do you think? Was it because those were the cases in which in the clinician's mind the link with transfusion was being made? I think that's probably the case. So um, um, in terms of cases other than possible cases of acute hepatitis B, to what extent did the centre receive such reports at all in the 80s? We, in the 80s, I, I'm not sure that I could say. I mean, definitely in later years, uh, we, we, we definitely received uh, cases uh, reported to us where there was a chronic hepatitis B infection and a transfusion at some point in the past, um, and hepatitis C as well. But... I don't remember in the 1980s. I think the focus was on acute hepatitis. And, and so in, in terms of, uh, and I appreciate it's difficult to remember without, without d d um, d documentary prompts, but in, in terms of reports of either chronic hepatitis B or non-A, non-B hepatitis or hepatitis C, so something of, of a chronic nature, would you be receiving such reports in the 90s or, or, or is it even more recently than that? Oh, more recently than that, yes. 
going to move next to the topic of hepatitis C screening. So the introduction of the, 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 the testing of, of donations at September 1991. Now, um, I understand from your witness statement that in, in terms of the, the in principle decision whether to introduce it and if so when, you were not involved in that process. That's correct. Um, can I just ask you to look at one document NHBT 0006421 underscore 002. This is a letter we looked at with Professor Contreras, 22nd of April 1991. It's addressed to Dr. Gunson. Um, and uh, if we just, I think for present purposes, need to read the first paragraph. Mm. Yes. I've read the minutes of the last meeting of the above committee and the attached letter from Philip Mortimer several times. I've also consulted with Pat Hewitt and John Barbara, and the three of us are of the opinion that we're going over the top with the proposed screening for anti-HCV. Now, Professor Contreras's evidence in relation to this letter was that she was not by talking about going over the top saying that there shouldn't be an introduction of hepatitis C screening, but that the way in which it was proposed it should be introduced was unnecessarily complicated. It, what can you recall? It was very specifically the way that the repeat reactive screening test results were to be managed uh, and the way that the samples were to be managed in relation to supplementary testing. And at that stage, we didn't have a confirmatory test for hepatitis C, so it was supplementary testing. And I, I believe, and it, it's implied there, that the UK Advisory Committee and Philip Mortimer, who was a virologist at the Public Health Laboratory Service, um, had come up with a, a um, protocol for how the samples should be handled and referred for further testing, which we felt was just completely, um, just over the top. It, it was excessive, it was complicated, it required us to to send one sample somewhere and another sample somewhere else. It wasn't the way we dealt with our other screening tests, and we felt that it would introduce unnecessary areas for errors to occur. Uh, and as well as which, I do remember there was a proposal that all the samples should uh, be refer have an ALT test carried out, and that was something over and above what was required for, conf for confirmation that there was hepatitis C positivity there, uh, that would require funding, uh, another element, another layer of, of um, complexity. Uh, and we felt that um, there were better ways uh, of organising the, the additional testing which was required. And is it right to understand that your involvement at North London with the introduction of hepatitis C screening um, was essentially the same as your involvement with the HIV screening. You were responsible for the management of the process in relation to the donors who returned a positive test result. That's correct. And, and so my responsibility was to make sure that whatever date was agreed to start screening, that my team was ready to deal with the results of the screening. But just before I ask you about the, then the, the, the process that, that was adopted in relation to, to the donors um, whose, whose donations are tested positive, you, you told us at the beginning this morning that you'd been the, in the hepatitis C litigation, which obviously was subsequent to this. You, you had been a liaison, a point of liaison between the blood service and um, the, the, the legal team. I'm not, not asking you about detailed discussions relating to the litigation itself, but... Uh, do, Professor Contreras told us, we looked at an email she'd written a, a, about a, um, a, a, a conversation she'd held or discussion she'd had with Dr. Gunson after the litigation about how he felt about it. Yes. D um, did you have any discussions with Dr. Gunson that you can recall which might cast any light upon his thinking about the issue of hepatitis C screening or, or his thoughts on the litigation? I clearly saw quite a lot of Dr. Gunson uh, at, throughout the litigation. Um, and I think he personally felt very responsible uh, 
perhaps unduly responsible for the failure to commence screening earlier. So that, that's, that's, that's an impression you have of, of yes. from, from your yes. dealings with him? Uh, in, then, in terms then of the, the arrangements that were put in place at uh, the North London Regional Transfusion Centre, um, we can, I think, pick it up probably most usefully by reference to your witness statement, statement WITN 3101009, please, Paul, page 26. Uh, so if we pick it up at the bottom of the page, paragraph 64, when HCV screening commenced in 1991, we adopted a similar approach to that for HIV, with the difference that the donor was informed in the initial letter that the HCV test had been confirmed positive and offered an appointment for an interview. So rather than the more yeah. ambiguous wording that you'd had in the HIV letters, this said in terms, hepatitis mm. C positive. Um, had donors been told that their donations were going to be tested for hepatitis C? Donors were told that their blood would be tested for HIV and other infections. I don't remember that there was specifically a reference to hepatitis C from September 1991. Uh, and then you continue, by this time as HIV infection had moved out geographically from central London and I had taken over management of positive hepatitis B test results, which were much more spread across the geographical area covered by NLBTC, I had a team of clinical staff who were involved in the post-test discussion work for, for HBV based at Edgware, Collendale, the West End uh, um, Centre, Luton, and the South Thames Regional Transfusion Centre at Tooting, which by then also fell under my remit. Uh, and then you talk about notification of HIV positive test results remaining with you. The numbers by then were small. And then paragraph 66, post-test notification for HCV was managed in much the same way as HBV. In the initial letter, the donor was invited to make an appointment for a face-to-face -face interview at one of the centres. The appointment was for one hour. The donor received information about the test results and the meaning of the results, which was not always clear in the early days of HCV screening, when HCV test confirmation depended on detection of the same HCV antibodies as used in the screening test. Pausing there... Do we understand that the same process was adopted as with HIV? That, in other words, you didn't contact the donor until you had the confirmatory result? In writing. In, write, in writing. Yes. Um, um, the hepatitis C confirmatory testing, was that also undertaken externally to the centre at a reference laboratory? It was initially, and yes, it, it was. It was at the same uh, reference centre as the HIV testing. Okay. Uh, and again, can you assist us with what typically the lapse of time might have been? It would be a week to 10 days. And the only th other thing I wanted to add, which I think I say later, is that with hepatitis B and hepatitis C, we sent the donor an information leaflet uh, with the initial letter. Um, and then um, it carries on, paragraph 67, um, you say you were fortunate in the close association with the Department of Virology at the Middlesex Hospital Medical School where our HBV and HIV confirmatory testing was carried out. We referred to our HCV positive samples there so that an HCV PCR test could be performed. Was that from the beginning? I can't remember, I'm afraid. So I, I, I imagine we can probably find that out from other sources. And then you say, in paragraph 68, donors whose results were confirmed positive were advised they should be seen at a specialist centre to have further investigation of their liver and an outline of the process was provided. And you describe... Um, that there'd been prior contact prior to the introduction of the screening with hepatology and gastroenterology units. Uh, but uh, as I understand it, the referral here was slightly different. This was via the, the GP. Yes, it was via the GP in the vast majority of cases. We did have uh, some donors who were actually not registered with a GP, um, in which case we would encourage them to do that. Uh, but there were some, a few donors who, for a variety of reasons, did not want their GP to be informed. And although we would always advise them of the advisability of their GP knowing, there were some who were insistent they did not want their GP to be informed. And we obviously had to take, uh, we had to abide by their wishes. In which case, we had one clinic uh, 
uh, which we were able to refer patients on an open access, so it didn't need to be a referral from the GP. I think in areas outside London it was much easier, but in London there was a lot of issues about uh, who was referring patients where, uh, and we had one open access clinic to whom we could refer for hepatitis B and C. Um, um, and then if we go over the page to paragraph 69, um, we can see there you, you talk halfway through that paragraph about devising a series of information leaflets for donors and that with HBV and HCV, the leaflet was sent with the notification letter. So I think that's what you were referring yes. to a moment or two ago. Yeah. Um, would you ever have informed a donor's GP of their test results, be it HIV, HCV or HBV, without the donor's consent? I can think of a couple of occasions. And without giving details of individuals mm. um, in any f form that might identify them, what kind of circumstances um, would have led to uh, th that? Um, it was where there was evidence that there was another person who was at risk, who were unaware that they were at risk, and the donor had indicated that they would not be sharing that information with the person who was at risk. So one case related to a mother and a child, and one case related to a man whose wife subsequently arrived at our, one of our blood donor sessions and who clearly did not know she was at risk and shouldn't be donating blood. And I did, I did take advice from the Medical Defence Union so I think we're not particularly helpful. Um, now, if we just go, sorry, can we just go back to the witness statement, Paul, page 27? So in paragraph 68, you talk about um, in, uh, having made contact with these hepatology and gastroenterology units in the, in the area in advance of HCV screening. So this was something you were able to do by um, September of 1991. Yes, and I thought I had done it, uh, but when I read some of the statements, I realised that there was a period when I was on leave and my locum actually did some of these visits, so I can't claim that I did them all. No. But, the, but the system, in any event, was, we, we, was set up for there to be specialist referral yeah. from the outset. Dr. Hewitt said that there's no mystery about it. The reason I'm asking you about that is because that is a facility available for infected donors differs from a lot of the experiences oh, I see. narrated to the inquiry by recipients of transfusions for whom getting referral to specialist services has been an uphill struggle in many cases. That's the reason so I wanted to ask. The first thing I think is we... And it's difficult to remember now, but in, in early 1991... It wasn't clear what should, what should be advised for people who were hepatitis C positive. Um, so firstly, we wanted to know what the hepatologists thought we should be doing um, so that we could apply the best practice to, to our donors. Um, and secondly, to ensure that we were going about it in the right way uh, so that people would get to them. I think that's the point. Uh, and for hepatitis C, it was, it was in general done through the, through the GP. But there was, in the early stages, there was a lot of, I think, false reassurance that if the, that person's liver function tests were normal, you didn't need to worry about it. And I think when we did a, an audit, um, we found that a proportion of donors were not being referred to the liver specialists, despite the advice we had given. So we did two things to try and strengthen the advice. The first thing was that we included a sentence in the letter to the GP saying that liver function tests were not a good indicator of whether there was any liver damage. And the second one was that we impressed upon the donor that we were writing to the GP to advise that the donor was referred to a specialist centre and that the donor should pursue that with their GP if they didn't hear about a referral. 
Um, can I then ask you to look at NHBT 302874-009, please? Um, th this is an article, uh, BMJ, March 1994, follow-up of blood donors positive for antibodies to hepatitis C virus. Um, uh, and uh, it, it's um, co-authored by yourself, Dr. Barbara, um, and uh, two others from the North London uh, Blood Transfusion Centre. Um, and uh, 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 it, am I right to understand uh, bottom of the first column before that, that table... You say there that to date there'd been no information on the effectiveness... Sorry, and then we need to carry on to the top of the next column, Paul, my apologies. N there'd been no information on the effectiveness of the counselling procedure and the fate of donors after leaving the transfusion centre. Mm. So prior to carrying out the study, you didn't really know what was happening um, once the donor had had their, their post-test discussion. discussion with you. And yeah. so there was a postal survey you describe here on follow-up arrangements for blood donors positive for antibodies to hepatitis C. And then this records then the outcome of the postal survey. Mm. So if we go to, um, if we just perhaps pick it up under the heading comments, bottom of the page, the positivity rate for antibodies to hepatitis C virus among first-time donors at the North London Blood Transfusion Centre is one in 1,400. Um, based on these figures, we should anticipate that 30 such asymptomatic subjects will be identified annually at the centre once the established donor panel have been screened. This survey shows that after counselling, 13 of 70 donors did not consult their general practitioner about the hepatitis C virus result. Of those who do, however, most are being referred to a specialist clinic. And numbers are likely to increase, given that the current advice from the centre to GPs is to refer all donors, irrespective of liver function value. So that's the point I think you were just making. Yes. It. All donors seen at hospital will need long-term surveillance, and many will have liver biopsies. And that's presumably the advice you had received from hepatologists. I think at that stage, yes, because I do recall that we used to um, mention that to the donors, and it's a bit that, that is quite sc scary information. The implications of hospital follow-up should be considered. The donor becomes a patient subject to a burden of anxiety owing to the possibility of morbidity disclosed by screening for antibodies to hepatitis C virus and the inconvenience of regular hospital visits. The financial burden of repeated attendance and monitoring should also be borne in mind. mind. Conversely, screening may offer donors a beneficial service in terms of the early detection of possible clinically significant liver disease that might be ameliorated by treatment. Both financial and psychosocial factors need to be taken into account when assessing the cost-effectiveness of the screening of blood donations and in planning resources for long-term follow-up of people identified as anti-HCV positive. Uh, just, I, I don't know whether you can assist us now with what was meant by a, um, a sentence in an article written in 1993, but okay. it, it's the reference to needing to take into account both financial and psychosocial factors when assessing cost-effectiveness. What, what, do you know what you were referring to there? Um, I think it may have been that uh, the cost the cost of screening blood donations was not just the, the cost of the test and the cost of the follow-up to the test, but there were further test costs further along the system, uh, indirect cost, if you like, of screening. Uh, we were not saying that it shouldn't be done. It's just that there are more costs to a screening test than are sometimes taken into account. So this wasn't advocating a cessation of, of, sc oh, definitely of screening not. or a follow-up? No, no. I think it was trying to impress that there, you know, that, that there are consequences um, that may be quite long-term uh, and involve significant cost. It wasn't a reason for not doing it. It was just pointing out that there are other costs involved in, in introducing screening tests. But would it be right to understand that the, the, the cost consequences for the NHS could cut both ways, as yes. I think you refer to here, because there's a cost to the NHS of the ongoing monitoring, but there's potentially a cost saving to the oh. NHS by early detection of disease that can be ameliorated by treatment and therefore never progresses to... Absolutely. To and I mean, at, at this stage, there wasn't any licensed treatment for hepatitis C, but of course, as we know, there was subsequently... Um, 
Can I then just ask you next about a couple of the committees um, that you had some involvement with in the, in the 1990s? Um, I'm not yet coming on to the BCJD incidents panel. Um, you were a member of the Standing Advisory Committee on Transfusion Transmitted Infections, SAC team. Yes. Um, and as I understand it, is this right? It, it was an advisory committee that reported to what's described as the executive committee of the UK BTS slash NIBSC liaison group. What, what did that actually mean in... Well, that, that is what later became known as JPAC, the Joint Professional Advisory Committee of the UK Blood Services. So is it right to understand that, the, that SACTI's role was essentially to provide advice to the blood transfusion service? Yes. Um, and its role was distinct from um, um, the M. BST, so the Advisory Committee on the Microbiological Safety of Blood, because the role of the of MBST was to advise the Department of Health. MSBT. MSBT, yes. sorry, was to <coughs> advise the Department of Health. As I understand it, yes. And it would have more of a policy-making role. Yes. Um, and, and I just want to look at a couple of documents just so that we're clear about that. Um, so if we look first of all at DHSC... 0006906 underscore 013. Um, so this is a letter from Dr. Robinson to Dr. Metters, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer in September 1995. Um, it says the Standing Advisory Committee on Transfusion Transmitted Infections is an expert advisory group which forms part of the committee structure reporting to the executive committee of the UK BTS NIBSC liaison group. Um, uh, prior to 1993, Dr. Gunson had chaired SACTI's predecessor, the ACTDD, Advisory Committee on Transfusion Transmitted Disease, which he'd set up to provide him an expert professional advice for the transfusion service. In 1993, with the advent of the NBA, it was felt to be more appropriate for the ACTDD to become part of the UK BTS NIBS liaison committee structure. And, and then we see the terms of reference to advise the UK BTS NIBSC liaison organisation, the National Blood Authority and SNBTS on all matters concerned with the possible transmission of infection by the transfusion of blood, its components, and via donor plasma fractionated plasma products. This advice should also cover the possible transmission of infection by other banked tissues processed by and held at transfusion centres to commission, conduct and coordinate trials of new technology involved in the screening of donors for infectious agents transmissible by transfusion, consistent with the work of the National Research Committee. Um, and then it goes on to talk about um, a, a number of other matters. So that, that was the, the remit of this particular Standing Advisory Committee. Is that right? Yes. And I'm not going to go through the detail of the multiple sets of minutes that we've provided you with, um, D D Dr Hewitt, but... It's a committee that then met regularly over the years, yes. looking at a range of different aspects of, of um, transfusion transmitted infection yes. um, and making recommendations um, which would then be considered by others um, ab about measures that could be taken to improve blood safety. So the recommendations went to JPAC? Right. So I think uh, initially back to them, the advisory committee on... I wasn't a part of. Oh, okay. I wasn't a right. part of that. Um, and, and so, just so that we can then understand the interrelationship between different committees, could we look at NHBT five zero eight eight underscore zero one one, please, Paul. Um, so th this is a, a set of minutes um, of SACTI, October 1995. We, we see you as one of those present. If we go to the second page. Um, under the heading, uh, half, just over halfway down the page, paragraph four, relationship of SACTI to MSBT. This issue has been clarified in recent correspondence from Dr. Metters, chairman of MSBT. SACTI is part of the Red Book structure. Um, the Red Book is, we've heard reference to it previously, but it, it became effectively the National Blood Transfusion Service Compendium of Guidance. Yes. Um, um, 
uh, and formally reports to the UK BTS NIBSC Executive Committee. SACT is responsible for, for providing professional advice to the UK BTS NIBS Committee and to national transfusion organisations on all matters concerned with the possible transmission of infection by transfusion of blood, its components, etc. And then the next paragraph, the professional advisory role of SACTI contrasts with that of MSBT, which is to advise ministers on policy. It's considered that formal links between the committees would compromise the respective remits of the two groups. The you were on SACTI, but you were not part of MSBT. I was not part of MSBT. And if we just go back to the previous page... Um, now, th this just gives the flavour of, of who was present and, and who had given their apologies at this particular meeting. Um, and we can see a, a, a number of those names that we recognise, including your own Dr. Barbara, Professor Cash, apologies from Dr. Robertson, Dr. Williamson, Dr. Snape, BPL. Dr. Flanagan was also part of the um, blood transfusion service. Yes. Dr. Follett... Dr. Follett was the head of the Microbiology Reference Unit in, uh, in Scotland. SMBTS, Scotland, yes. Um, and then Professor Tedder, um, whose name we've seen on multiple occasions, and Dr. Mortar, who, who you've already Dr. referred Mortimer, to. Dr. Mortar, yes. Um, so there's, there's and, no Dr. and Dr. Minor. Oh, yes, apologies. And who was Dr. Minor? Dr. Minor was from NIBSC, okay. National Institute of Biological Standards and Control. So, uh, other than a link with the NIBSC, is it right to understand that the, the, the Department of Health did not form part of, of no. SACTI? No. Uh, 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 neither as members or observers. And that contrasts with MSBT, which, as we um, saw, was chaired by Dr Metters, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer. Um, now, one of the other standing committees... Um, that you were involved with was the Standing Advisory Committee on the Selection of Donors. Yes. Is that right? Um, again, there were multiple minutes. I don't propose to look at the, 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 the detail of them. Um, but is it right to understand that the Standing Advisory Committee on the Selection of Donors essentially was a national forum for those in, involved with the Blood Transfusion Service to formulate a national approach to issues of donor selection, exclusion, uh, issues relating to leaflets, publications, and so on. That's correct, yes. Um, so rather than it being left now to um, individual regional transfusion centres mm -hmm. to develop their own policies that might be discussed at regional transfusion director meetings or might not, this pulled together the whole of the service. Yes, and I, I think um, there had been a, a sort of predecessor group which Dr Wagstaff had, had initiated, which then became the uh, Standing Advisory Committee on Care and Selection of Donors. Um, and, and then I just wanted to ask you about something in, in one set of minutes um, of, of this particular committee. Uh, JPAC We go, so I'll, we'll just look at the date, January 1997, a meeting of the Standard Advisory Committee on the Selection of Donors, and we can see a range of attendees there. If we just go to the bottom of page three, please, Paul. Um, there's a heading hearsay evidence on the fitness of people to donate. Mm. Um, there's reference to uh, a communication from the Hawksworth Blood Centre. And then it says, concern was expressed about the practice of writing to people informing them that their blood could not be used because of information received. It was agreed that whenever possible, donors should be contacted by the donor consultants and given every opportunity to clarify concerns that may have arisen from hearsay. Concerning evidence of lifestyle factors affecting suitability to give blood, as revealed by virology testing, Pat Hewitt reported that a study had been conducted in North London over the last five years which covered 27 reports of hearsay evidence concerning the individual fitness of donors to give blood. Eight of these reports were corroborated from sources felt to be reliable and withdrawn. When it says and withdrawn, does that mean the donations were then withdrawn? 
The donors will. The donors will join from. Yeah. Um, and then over the page, there's a sentence: virology testing, particularly anti-hepatitis B core, correlated very poorly. It was agreed that the principle should be that if the evidence is not given anonymously, it should be acted on. If the information is given anonymously or is unaccessible as from an unreliable source, it should be ignored. Um, can, can you just help us in understanding what, what role this played in, in the donor selection process and, and the, a little more about the study that you referred to? Yes, it, it wasn't really the donor selection process, but it was... It, it this sort of issue fell to this Standing Advisory Committee. So this was, uh, and this Standing Advisory Committee was an opportunity for uh, blood, blood services to feed in issues which they felt they needed help with that they couldn't manage locally. And this was in relation to, uh, as, as is implied, um, information being received from sources other than the donor, that the, the donor was not suitable to donate. So you'd get somebody sort of saying, uh, I know this person and I know they're a paedophile. Um, and what were we supposed to then do with that information? And this was an effort to try and formulate some sort of guidance on about how to deal with this sort of information that was occasionally received within blood centres. So the kind of information that, that, that might be reliable, it refers to some reports having been corroborated. Um, um, might that be, for example, someone reporting that they believed a donor was an, in, uh, an IV drug user? Yes. Something along those lines? Yes, something along those lines. Um, but what we tried to do was, give, was, was to try and corroborate that information, either from the donor, him or herself, or from other sources. Um, and then could we please now have JPAC 601 underscore 014, please? So this is a document dated November 1995. It's headed the Blood Safety Leaflet Background Information for Transfusion Service Staff, prepared by Dr. Peter Flanagan on behalf of, and then this is the committee we've just been looking at, Standard, Standing Advisory Committee on Donors. We go over the page. And I just wanted to read a a handful of paragraphs and then, and then ask you about it. So in the introduction, uh, uh, we um, see it set out, the maintenance of a safe blood supply is a primary objective of blood transfusion services. A number of mechanisms are employ, employed to aid achievement of this ob objective. Screening for virological markers is a key element of such programs. Improvements in assay design have increased the effectiveness of screening programs due to improvements in sensitivity, especially during the early phase in, of infection. However, assays may fail to identify a proportion of infected individuals. This is particularly the case in the early stages of infection before the development of positive markers, the so-called window period. The careful application of appropriate donor exclusion criteria can add to the benefit of screening assays by identifying prospective donors whose behaviour puts them at risk of acquiring transfusion transmissible infections and thereby reducing the likelihood of infectious seronegative donations entering the blood supply. So would it be right to understand this is essentially reinforcing what you said to us this morning, that donor selection always remains, mm. uh, notwithstanding the availability of, te of testing, um, a primary tool for yes. the blood transfusion service. Um, and then we can see it said that the, it refers to a new blood safety leaflet designed to outline key donor exclusions, which are currently regarded as important in maintaining a safe blood supply. It's going to replace the current AIDS leaflet um, which had been in use um, over the last few years. And then if we go two further paragraphs down, please. There's a paragraph beginning, the introduction of HCV antibody screening in 1991 showed that a significant number of donors found to be infected with this virus should have been excluded on the basis of the current AIDS leaflet. It was agreed to extend the scope of the new leaflet to include hepatitis B virus and hepatitis C virus in the belief that this may increase the effectiveness of the leaflet. Now, can you just help us with understanding the first sentence there? Um, uh, um, the, the, once hepatitis C screening was available, some of those found to be infected, it would appear from this have been identified as people who actually the existing leaflet should have led to, to their self-exclusion. Is that right? Yes, and this gets us back to the point we were discussing this morning. 
um, people who um, generally, I, I think that the biggest group was people who had used intravenous drugs on one or two occasions but had not considered themselves to be drug users and there was a, an, an attempt to strengthen the message about what, what was meant. Um, uh, and then um, the, the proposal is to extend the new leaflets to include hepatitis B and hepatitis C. So would that introduce into the leaflet people who, who are carriers of HBV and HCV? Is that the way it was going to be put? It, it was just be, because the AIDS leaflet has concentrated so much about HIV and the risk of HIV infection that there was a tendency to forget that there were other things. Um, and to, we thought that a, a more generic approach would be more effective. Um, now, one, one of the issues that, that seems to, on a reading of the, the minutes of um, the, the, uh, both, the, both these committees to come up um, uh, uh, um, over the years um, was continued cases of transmu transfusion transmitted hepatitis B. Um, and there are discussions at various times about introducing anti-HBC testing or, or talking about donors with a history of hepatitis B. I'm, I'm not going to go through mm. them document by mm. document. I, 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 they've been sent to you, and I'm, I imagine you've had the opportunity to consider them. Uh, um, what can you recall in broad terms about the, the continuing concern in the 1990s about hepatitis B transmission? Not as I understand it in vast numbers, but still yes, happening. Yes, um, in, in very small numbers, but there's always a tendency to think that once you have a screening test in place, everything is, is fine. Uh, and we knew that we were still transmitting um, a handful of cases of hepatitis B and trying to get a handle on was there anything more that could be done to reduce that risk. Um, I think Professor Contreras referred to the fact that um, it appeared to be that in many cases... Uh, the donors who presented that risk were people who had had long-term chronic hepatitis B and whose levels of virus had dropped to such low levels that they could not be detected in the surface antigen test. Um, and that was where the anti-hepatitis B core testing could have had a place because you, you don't lose your hepatitis B core antibodies. They remain uh, as a marker of exposure in the past. Um, but over the 1990s and subsequently, um, as we got more sophisticated tests, the hepatitis B surface antigen tests improved in sensitivity, so they were able to detect lower levels of surface antigen. And the pattern seemed to change in that we then seemed to find that the very few cases of hepatitis B transmission that we could prove were due to transfusion uh, were occurring because donors were presenting very early in hepatitis B infection, before surface antigen had had a chance to develop, and before anti-core, anti-hepatitis B core would have developed also. And so there was a real dilemma about what's the right thing to do. If we're going to do something, what's going to be effective? And there were discussions about, is anti-hepatitis B core testing something that would produce a a additional level of safety for the, the costs involved uh, or is it that we need to do something else and I think these conversations went on as, as you'll be aware for, for some time and then was overtaken by the fact that uh, the blood service introduced hepatitis B nucleic acid testing which was a byproduct of something else but, but dealt with the case of early infections in donors. And can you recall roughly when that was introduced? If you can't, I'm sure we can find out from other means. It was sometime in the 2000s. The hepatitis C nucleic acid testing was 1999, I, I believe. And then the HIV nucleic acid testing came in a few years later, and hepatitis B came in on the back of that. And, and the abbreviation or the acronym we see in the papers is NAT. NAT, yes. So we'll see HCV NAT or HPV yes. NAT or yes. HIV NAT yes. in, the, in the documents. Um, so although if we, if we trace through some of the various minutes in the course of the 1990s, 
the issue of the introduction of anti-HBC core testing was, as you say, d discussed over a, quite a prolonged mm. period of time. Yes. It was not introduced and then, yes. and then eventually was overtaken by, by the availability of the, yes. the, the, the yes. replacement test. Um, if we just look at your look back statement, so WITN 3101006, please. And if we go to page 149, um, you refer um, mm. in this section of your statement to um, a study that you were involved um, um, with, um, which looked at uh, um, the, the possibility of of uh, um, anti-HBC core screening. Um, I wasn't, again, proposing to go through the detail of it, but if we go to page 152, I think we can see the conclusion at the top of the page. The conclusions from the study were that adding anti-HBC to the routine test for hepatitis B surface antigen could identify additional donors capable of transmitting hepatitis B. So it, the, the, the study, is this right, showed that anti-HBC might capture those cases that were getting through. But then you explain in paragraph 401, in practice, it was never recommended for routine use and routine testing for HBV DNA was introduced. Yes, it, it might have captured some of the cases. Yeah. Not, not all. Not all, no. Um, so I'm now about to move on to look back uh, both HIV and hepatitis C. So given the time, perhaps we could break now and pick that up. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll take our customary break then until quarter to four. Uh, quarter to four. <laughs> 